Thank you, everybody. I think Vijay has really set the base as to what are the crucial issues when we talk of the valgus deformity and how do we go about con collecting it, what are the red flags, what, where to concentrate, where not to concentrate, how to sort of uh, you know, get over difficult situations. I am taking on the just a road to consider as a one case on which the various aspects we will discuss uh, or just to bring out what is important, uh, back to basics, what I would say, the principles and the management factorials that go into this case. Once we have a valgus deformity on your, in your uh, consulting office, uh, things you specifically look for and document has to be the etiology. It's very, very important uh, because that does speak uh, volumes of it. It's stiff inflammatory etiology. We'll talk about laxities. Fixed or a correctable deformity. What is the degree of correctability? It's also very important. Make sure that you are testing again and again about the MCL. It goes stressed all the time. I think you have to think about MCL all the time. And however much you emphasize, it's not enough. The end point, what you find of the MCL, usually will be doing a stress test. If you don't get a very hard end point, then you know that probably it is uncompromised. Thigh girth, I think thigh girth has some factor in terms of how much of a correction we do or we leave some little residue valgus. Because if you totally correct again these valgus in very thigh, high thigh girths, they are never happy functionally. So I think this is a point you need to ponder, look at it, whether they are really hitting it. Patella articulation and tracking, of course, goes along with the valgus all the time. Secondary foot changes, of which you will hear a little bit from our foot colleague uh, towards the end of the presentation, right after this, whether there's a plano valgus eversion, painful, how much it is impact. One thing we should focus is the other planar deformities, especially because we keep talking about the valgus, but we have to look at whether there's any associated hyperextension or a flexion deformity, and also axial or rotational tibial deformity. This ends as a part of the evolution of the whole valgus process. I'm sorry, this uh, one uh, little video is not playing up. What is what I wanted to show here was that gait assessment brings out so many aspects. I think you have to lift the tie up and then make sure that you see the patient walking. All the dynamic instabilities, the way they are thrusting, the medial thrust, the flexion, the foot eversion, and also how the hip toggles, all this aspect comes out and they all have a factor in terms of how you plan and what you plan especially the thrust and the hyperextension. So almost always make sure you do this. The same way I think you do the flexion extension test so that you know the valgus, whether it disappears, partially disappears, because this gives us an indication whether the lesion is the tibia or the femur and also only the distal femur or both distal and the posterior femur. I think these are some facts, even without the X-ray, you could get uh, into a fair amount of understanding on these things. This is the whole bunch of x-rays you should have all the time. This is something as a policy for all the knee cases in our unit. Basically, basically one, this documents every single case. And the second part is also the fact that you are able to study all the proximal and distal deformities. Short films alone is a total no-no because you will certainly mix the proximal things. Like in this case, she also has a hip pathology on both sides. So the thing is you have got to go have a scanogram, which is a policy, valgus, plain x-rays, the valgus stress x-rays, what you see here, I think this is necessary. And also, of course, the patella of use so that you know how well the patella is working, what more will you need to do in terms of specifically focusing on the patella. Valgus correction angle is something you all are familiar with. I think this is something you must draw on a long leg film. I think that where, where, where you have the anatomic axis, which goes to the center of the medullary canal, and then you have the mechanical line, which is drawn from the center of the femoral head to the center of the knee, which is more in the middle. The angle supplemented normally is about 60 degrees of valgus, and this is the anatomical valgus cut, which you usually incorporate when you cut the distal femur, which is between five and seven degrees of femur, uh, five and seven degrees on an average about six. But now it has been adequately studied and then seen that a lot of patients, especially in South Asia and Southeast Asia, seem to show uh, ranges beyond this. There are people who show nine degrees to valgus to about three degrees. So there's a fair amount of fluctuation and the extreme beyond the normal of five to seven, you will probably see in at least about 20, 25% of the cases. And this has been well studied and published by our close colleague, Dr. Mulaji. Arun, in his publication way back in 2013 or 12, I think, he pulled out all his valgus femurs and he had made a good decision. And by his sort of an assessment and classification, he in fact, denomenclatured the randomized classification of valgus of type one, two, and three. We just gave you some angles, but doesn't give us any functional significance how that helps us in terms of planning your procedure. 
So the fundamental, when you approach to understand what this vulgar sea is, You have a valgus deformity, is it collectible or fixed? Is there any associated pathology like hyperextension or flexion deformity? So that's those type one, two, three, four depict only this. But what is functionally what you're looking for is the intact ACL, MCL, correctability or non-correctability, any hyperextension or flexion deformity. In a small percentage of these cases, very severe stiff cases, you may find a very severe valgus where the MCL is very incompetent like the example we just showed towards the end, where I think you have to resort to more severe options or significant extra-articular deformities, probably which you may not be able to correct intra-articularly and it may add or require another associated procedure. One aspect what we have observed over time is a sagittal plane deformity like a hyperextension or flexion amplifies the valgus which you see on the, the clinical patient. It looks like a very grotesque valgus. But when the moment you correct this hyperextension or the flexion, and then you try it, you find suddenly the severity of the valgus is not so bad. So I think this is basically because of the optical visual error, illusion probably, that to a great extent you'll find when you have combined multiplanar deformities, the pure valgus may not be that bad after all, and that we can assess it. Core issues when you plan the procedure is one, of course, is an approach whether we are going to use a medial approach or the anterolateral side and then the distal femoral preparation. I'm going to focus on these five. The distal femoral preparation, the sequence of steps, whether you do the flexion gap first or otherwise, or is there any rationale in doing one over the other as a first sequence of release and the extent of release and the degree of constraint, what you will need. Our policy in the Institute has been dominantly the medial, uh, medial parapetal approach. I, for example, I have not done one, uh, a single lateral arthrotomy, though I suppose there is certainly some advantages and the stiff valgus, the axis is direct. But when you try to do a procedure offhand only once after a long gap, I think you are not familiar with the way the knee looks, there are potential possibility of errors are there. So if you are familiar with the procedure, you have assisted very many, you are very comfortable, it's an elegant approach. What I was just one uh, important point, the closure, you should be very familiar with that fact fact. Otherwise, that could be sort of an arthrotomy which cannot be completely closed. So I think it has its own place, but we, in our institute, predominantly we have been using only the valgus uh, medial parapetal approach. Let's start with the distal femur. Yes, conventional preparation of the distal femur, we all know we make the sort of a point of entry, which is just about five millimeters above the PCL insertion. And then you get your uh, dial, your distal angle at about 60 degree valgus. And then, uh, but in the case of the valgus deformities, I think what is important is you should, to make it very clear, reduce your distal valgus cut to about three degree angles. The reason for reducing from five to seven or six to three is basically to accommodate the metaphysical remodeling, which happens in the distal femur over the time of the deformity as it progresses. Another point which you should look at when you cut is when you sort of size the distal femur lateral, the distal femur medial side, make sure that the lateral side is not more than two or three millimeters or almost sometimes zero, especially when you have distal femoral deficiencies. On the medial side, uh, like Vijay had mentioned, the medial cut as far as possible, let it be eight millimeters or less. Maybe in some situations, you may need to increase it by a millimeter or two but at least eight millimeters to nine millimeters, you will not exceed this. And usually 8.5 to nine millimeters is a standard distal thickness of any of the components. If you tend to dissect or resect more on the distal side, you will end up with a bigger medial gap, which will enable or require the necessity of more lateral sort of a release on the lateral side. One other point when you have to factor when you plan the variables is the medial laxity. Look at the mechanical axis. And also, the, of course, the neck shaft angle, a coxa vara, coxa valga, to some extent can have an impact when you drop down a mechanical axis line from the center of the hip to the center of the knee. And the VCA angle, which we talked about a while ago, intrinsic valgus of the distal femur, whether it is really exceeding, in which case you will have to make some adjustments to your distal angle. And factor the lateral condylar hypoplasia and the significance of the adversary. So some useful bullets for the distal preparation besides maintaining the valgus cut uh, angle at three degrees is the point of entry to this will be slightly medial. So when you draw the anatomical line from the disc along the femoral shaft, you will find that this needs to bisect here. It only ends somewhere on the medial condyle. 
if there is a hyper extension you may probably choose to decrease the depth of the cut by a millimeter or two but like a reiterate again medial side no more than 8 millimeters factor the hypoplasia and the correctively if you do this i think probably you are on much safer grounds if at the same time if you need to cut more you can always revisit this this is a very classical case uh, which probably i did about 24 years ago in the 90s uh, which really depicts what we are talking here this gentleman had dual deformity a coxal the proximal septal fracture and this femoral injury gave rise to a valgus deformity at the joint level and he had developed a secondary remodeling here so now if you see in this case where there is hardly any lateral condyle when you sort of found a distal femoral cut nothing it's not going to cut anything like you see in the uh, picture here it just brushes on the lateral side you take only about 8 mm or 9 mm on the femoral side fortunately in this case for this gentleman was that the mechanical axis was absolutely subsiding in the middle so a cut perpendicular this line was absolutely perfect make sure you keep the short rods when you keep this because sometimes a long rods you will not be able to enter and your point of entry like i mentioned will be slightly more medial than compared to the lateral which can be determined by just dropping a line right down the center of the distal shaft and then you decide where you want to come so that is the area where you will focus you will study how it goes so that you decide what sort of time the tibial cut usually follows the standard techniques of the extramedullary cut which is um, very similar you usually cut perpendicular to the tibia uh, and using both the proximal and the distal orientation points again in this side i think it is necessary to drop down the axis on the tibia and more and more i think it's less and less talk is about the tibia valga which can impact and to that point i credit to one of our colleagues from the south dr dhanasekar from ganga institute who has studied and he published about the impact it can have especially the tibia valga like what dr vijay showed in his case the problem in the long run it created so we need to file file or find a way to do this so we again apply the same what we did on the femoral side medial tibial bowing could be common in valgus but severe valgus especially if the deformity goes beyond 15 18 degrees anticipate some tibia valga and often in these cases when you have significant tibia valga what we'll also notice is very importantly the external rotation of the tibial base plate externally rotated completely and the femoral tibia to the center of the ankle there is a fear that you may cut the distal proximal tibia in a little bit of a varus and which is probably definitely a no no so what it is doing, uh, uh, advisable in this again is again deflect your tibial point or the proximal reference point of the tibia to more and more medial based upon the axis which you draw on the long side of the tibia side so if it is extreme valgus well, probably you may need to have a point of entry here almost very much medial of the medial condyle when you put place your em jigs so that will help you with it but all this is true talking if you have standardized the x rays if you internally rotate the x ray or externally rotate the limb and take an x ray that's not going to give you the appropriate information you look for in these cases so once you have done this and exposed the joint i think the talk we talk about the initial release one thing we also found very useful in the valgus is like we do the posteromedial corner release in the ciliar varus of the tibia you find in the lateral side again taking of these osteophytes like you see in this picture helps immensely in these cases you could also release the sort of a proximally attached it band in the upper fibers so this sort of a step gives you the initial relief or initial release of this guy expose expose the lateral completely and like i said if it is externally rotated the tibia doesn't sublux or take off this osteophytes you are able to bring the tibia out completely and that helps and this is the type of the cut you will probably or notice in this lateral side hardly less and the medial side not exceeding more than about 8 or 9 mm on the tibial side once you have done the distal femur and the proximal tibia comes the aim to achieve the extension space and a minimum of approximately at least about 18 mm constantly you make sure your one index finger goes on to the medial side and sees how the tibial medial collateral ligament feels you respect your whether you do manual whether you do with the jigs navigation whatever and then you start to often times we'll find that the thing is trapezoidal they are not parallel and this means that your lateral structures are still tight that again brings us to the point what will be releasing when and if you have something like a you have taken for example if it is a valgus fully in extension your expected tissues that are going to be tight are the it band and the posterior lateral corner of the femur 
this postulatory cordon of the femur would have got released and cleared by the time you do this. And you also take this as an opportunity when you take off the osteophyte to just dissect the subperiosteal little further down so that the postulatory capsule in that corner gets released and it is pretty safe in this situation. And then you can put in the slip spacer block, see for the laxity. Sometimes you may find a millimeter or two opening on the medial side. Don't rush to further releasing it. Probably you will be able to adjust it subsequently. And, but if it is more than two or three millimeters, certainly yes, you need to do in this case. And what we do when we have extreme opening in extension is you could pie crest. There are various ways. Spike cresting is something or the nailing we have uh, talked about and it has been pretty much popularized by Dr. Ranawat and other people. And what you do is you put the joint in extension. Once you leave the joint in extension tight with the lamina spreaders, you, uh, you open the joint, you put the uh, lamina spreader out into it after clearing the posterior lateral corner. So your focus and your attention is purely the posterior lateral corner and the IT band here. Sometimes, yeah. So you see the correctability and the degree of collection you might need. We'll come back to that again at some point. And then after you have cut both to the tibia and the femur, you see that in the laterally, you have not hardly cut anything because you still find the cartilage there. You then put, and then you can take, put the leave the uh, limb in extension in tension and then you can bring in your 15 blade knife and you can start doing multiple sort of stab knife incisions and slowly you find it opens. Like here, if it opens about two millimeters, I would again do a couple of more stabs so that it becomes solid and then we know. So we are pie cresting essentially the structures what we are handling here in the postlateral corner is the IT band structures as you come towards the mid lateral and the lateral collateral. Lateral collateral is not touched at this stage at all. The fear of uh, lateral popliteal nerve need not be there. It is pretty much far. Only point of importance is your knife need not or should not penetrate more than about four millimeters to five millimeters. Though it is safe till about nine, I would sort of recommend that don't go more than five. And it's not necessary because you are cutting. These stretch tissues are very thin. At the moment, you just stab the knife, they just open up and you can feel the uh, sort of a uh, um, sort of a crepitus which you find. The nerve is pretty much far. Once you've done this, so you've got extension gap, you know the extension gap it is there in the valgus, uh, and then you can do the AP preparation. The anteroposterior femoral preparation, setting the rotation. You have three options. I will just go rapidly with this, epicondylar. It should work in most situations. Posterior con condylar axis is the most unreliable. I don't think you should do because, especially because in most of the situations, you find the posterior condylar is hypoplastic. And the second thing, white side line is extremely difficult to define. In these cases, it's again an unreliable thing unless you have been a white side person all the time. What are good is basically the epicondylar axis. If the posterior condyl is not totally deformed, maybe, but the trivial cut surface is an extremely useful tool. And if possible, the ideal solution is always use a combination, not one single reference. And you can probably use both the references, which will be good. With this cut, I think with the user, I personally use the tibial surface as a good guide, which is pretty much predictable and good. And then uh, we place the jib and you let it dial to a parallel collinear space. Once you have a rectangular space posterior inferiorly, which is equal also in terms of thickness to the extension space you have defined, it becomes extremely easy. You are already balanced both in flexion and extension. So the point here when you dial is you don't have to worry about it. Often it goes to the external. If you, uh, avoid too much internal rotation, it's a no-no because that doesn't support the patella. Sometimes from the three degree external rotation, probably you may end up with two or a one, and it may be native, that is fairly fine, but don't go into the internal, that's a strict no-no. Reconfirm with the tibial cut, reconfirm with the epicondylar line, and so you are pretty much sure. So my alignment in this should not be there, so posterior reference is totally avoidable. And then, what, then comes uh, the, the points of discussion, so we are, uh, now had an equal balance flexion extension say, space, but how did we achieve this? The principle of valgus release is stretch the contracted lateral structures and lengthen the medial, equal to the length of the medial structures. It is done just release, the amount of release should equal to the tension on the medial side. Often you find that passively when you correct, it corrects neutral, but that is not the way it has to be. Basically because if you correct like this, if it is stretched out, it is in valgus. If you bring it in neutral and if you have a relaxed medial side, 
it is still relaxed. It is not dry. Only after you release on the lateral side and it comes to the same tension on the medial, you have achieved the correction. So the correctability of the deformity to the neutral axis with not balanced ligaments is not corrected. You have to have balanced ligaments and the limb axis in neutral. So to that point, you will need to release the lateral side and appropriately titrate the structure is what you are going to release. There are a lot of uh, initial uh, the years you would uh, learn the sequence of cut first IT band, first lateral, then lateral, collateral, popliteus, crack hole, run over. Others uh, did, of course, in the very early times, uh, published uh, this sort of a sequence of the typical uh, soft tissue releases. But over a time, as they understood that the uh, deformity is better, I think even they, these surgeons have been advocating less and less, and the release became pie crusting and uh, very so uh, selective releases which are being done. So do not go into this part because this is pretty much confusing. Only one thing that came out of in vitro studies is lateral collateral ligament release gives maximum correction. Remember that. So in extreme stiff deformities, releasing the lateral collateral ligament would need it. And the popliteus, the IT band, these are all more dynamic structures because they are attached to the muscles and you can control with the greater release. So the reason or the necessity to do any of these releases will again depend upon how tight the deformity is. Now the third point I would like to emphasize as much as possible, if you can stabilize or retain at least two of the four stabilizers Dr. Vijay mentioned, postlateral corner, lateral collateral ligament, IT band and the popliteus. If you can retain two of them, that will be excellent because then it can take care of the valgus. You will never be in a failure mode in these cases. So in extension only, if you have only extension valgus, no flexion valgus, these usually are correctable, commonly as a cause of distal femoral erosion or hypoplasia. The release you require is the IT band and the postlateral capsule. You can do pie crest and you can get it down. Lateral collateral ligament and the popliteus can remain intact and not a problem at all. Sometimes you may need to augment, but rarely do we augment the distal femur. All those defects can be taken care of with the cement. So release the IT band, pie crest the tibia from the tibia and augment the distal femur. Sometimes if you don't want to pike this, you can also release the IT band from the tibial side during your exposure. That's uh, your call and how familiar you are doing. But I can, we can assure you that uh, just uh, pike is good to collect this. Stiff extra articular deformities will require much more release than conventional all structures. Remember one thing, if they are associated with flexion deformity, this IT band and other structures tend to get contracted, popliteus also, along the flexion axis. That's why it doesn't come out. So you will need extensive releases. You may need to release the popliteus and then release the LCL as the last structure in this postulateral corner here. If for some reason you are uncomfortable, I think these are situations, if you have not got it right or if you're worried about, you may need to think of sort of uh, increasing the constraint. But on the other side, sticking to the principle of uh, preserving two of the four of these structures, sliding osteotomy is one of the very elegant procedures uh, where you take a sliver of the lateral condyle completely along with the attachment of the lateral collateral and the popliteus, where you see below here these two points. And then you correct the deformity uh, and then bring the, distalize the attachment to this. This way, I think you are doing a bony section, like we do an orthocranial osteotomy for the distal humerus or a trochanteric osteotomy for the hip. This is something like that to that point and then reattach it distally. But uh, be careful to do in the sense that there should be a fairly adequate thickness. This is well described by many people. I think you should familiarize it yourself with the anatomy and the way you do it and proceed. When in doubt, any time, I think add the constraint. Today, there is no role for imbrication and other procedures. The valgus is in both flexion and extension. Usually, they are intracondylar, significant lateral condylar hypoplasia. I think you would do the primary extension releases and the postulateral corner and the IT band. And as much as required, if necessary, you will go with the popliteus and lastly, probably the LCL gradually. And like I said, most of the time you can release it. So the sequence of the release here will be postulateral corner, picrus, the IT and the LCL, then come the popliteus. The, <clears throat> if you also look at, you should also take some care in the component positioning. Most of this will have external rotation deformity. And take off the postulateral osteophytes, don't oversize it. Constraint, you have to descend on the table based upon the situation. Tibial deformity causing a valgus usually is erosive, very straightforward, often seen in inflammatory diseases. They are usually correctable, contain defects, never you need to put bone grafts or any augments. Appropriate standard tibial cuts, cement is a good filler for these cases. 
patella in the voice i think is something you will need to pay some attention to it uh, agr philosophy has been we have not we are not been resurfacing in any of these situations we prepare the, the patella like we do if all other previous the, all the talked about former elements are good you will find patella tracks well you will not have much of a problem should there be still a sort of valgus still in the patella i think osteophytectomy marginal releases shaving the lateral ridge the lateral releases helps uh, significantly the other thing we should do is the two stitch method where we just take two synovial sutures to see whether it uh, stabilizes if it is not probably then we will do a lateral release from the extra articular side not from the intra articular just a couple of examples this was a straight forward valgus with a lateral deficit it was partially correctable needed a lateral release of the pike rusting with the standard techniques and standard components is fine this was what i was telling you small defects on the femoral condylar area can be fixed up pretty easily another of this if the bone is very soft sometimes you will find significant deformity or the defect in the tibia is much higher don't hesitate adding a stem that stabilizes the tibial base plate and we have a better fixation this is another of these examples where we have the valgus that we have corrected with a sort of a metaphyseal deformity that you can see the metatarsal tibial side at first maybe there is not much problem in severe valgus with a fixed valgus deformity be careful the release may be complete like we again wait wait go back non correction more than 20 degree of flexion deformity in addition one you should consider the need for constraint in all these cases there is no question about it you will need to come just one part of question two i will sign off with these cases this was a 26 27 degree stiff valgus non correcting it was done very early in my learning curve and we did this do not do the two mistakes if you are uncomfortable you have done extensive releases there is no place for any type of a mobile bearing and you have straight away got to jump with a constraint this happened to me in the first month and i had to revise him in five weeks to a constraint process a fixed bearing so when you have extensive lateral releases pay extra attention to the stability and the level of constraint today all this repair reefing procedures have surpassed formerly there was a discussion of deficient ligament which can be reconstructed in various ways and crack of sutures and other things i think they are now put off to history i think nobody does ever at this scale this is again one example in the same thing this lady had a valgus corrected then you find the need there's a medial imbrication was done it failed and we had to revise again with the constraint processes so there's no room for all this i think should still and i uh, conclusion i think what is the key take home is the titrated graduated release is the key understand the patho anatomy so exactly you know what to release and where to release define the bone issues so that you know how much to cut femur how much to cut tibia and how, what way to cut and what factors to look at define the mcl that's a crucial thing which is going to buy value off once you know what the situation is you are much much better off and make sure you have the things ready balance the gaps like we said we do the extension balance first and then the flexion balance next and factor the vca in extreme cases for the distal femoral thank you